All right, so we have kind of finished talking about how to use function, how to use function as the continuation passing styles. And today we will kind of wrap up the concept of function uh, by kind of finishing the topic with what we call function closure. Uh, and next week we will start to talk about the type system and we will actually talk about how, how to actually uh, take advantage of different things you can do in Scala regarding the type system. And to actually kind of like refresh everything, right? Yesterday was a holiday, Make uh, I hope you get some break. Uh, I can guess with my usual like undergrad uh, schedule that happened, holiday is basically catch up time for homework. So I hope you catch up. So let's do a recap in case you kind of forgot what we covered on Tuesday. So we covered continuation, which is basically, let's look at uh, tail recursion, right? So our hour function kind of returns something and we can say that, hey, uh, we can use function as the input and we can actually return a function. So that basically kind of means that if you do a recursion normally, instead of, instead of calling a new function and pass in the accumulator. You pass in a new function. Basically, you create a totally new function. Why we can do that? Basically, functions are value, right? So uh, you can do the same thing. And this is called continuation passing style, which basically allow you to make every function a tail call. Uh, and we use the sum as an example. So this is basically the normal recursion on how you can sum the number in the list, right? Uh, we also go to, uh, and then on the lecture on last Tuesday, which we are not going to cover again because it, otherwise it will take too much time, uh, is we convert this summation function and write this in the CPS style by passing in instead of one single accumulator, you pass a function as an accumulator. Uh, we also talk about binary tree. Uh, so we look at how it's defined where you can have an empty node or a node can be a node with two subtrees, right? And we actually make a trick called tree where it consists of a singleton object called empty or uh, a class node which has the left side, the right side, and the key in the middle, right? That extends the tree. Then we kind of wrap it up with the concept behind currying, right? Uh, currying kind of basically means that instead of accepting parameters normally where you wait until every single input into your function is ready, you start to process the inputs whenever they become available. How can you do that? So this is uncurried version. You wait for X and Y and Z. Once all of them are available, you run whatever is in that function, right? Again, uh, you can do sort triple uh, this way, where you wait for X and Y and C, and you're gonna run the function. How can you do this with currying? Here's how you can do it with def, right? Uh, you define sort triple uh, as a function. Then you have parentheses over each individual input, each individual input. In this case, you are going to evaluate X whenever X becomes available, evaluate Y whenever Y becomes available. Basically, you're gonna replace the variable X and Y and Z inside the function definition whenever you have the value, which means that you can kind of do short circuit, you actually can get the result ahead of time because sometimes some of the variable just disappear because it get multiplied by zero, it get and with false, it get or with true, right? These things would make certain dependency goes away. Uh, so basically means that currying has a benefit of you can stage the function call. You can execute parts of your function as soon as the value are ready, which maps to data flow model really well, which means that this allow the compiler and hardware to become faster. Uh, one quick thing I can tell you is on the hardware side, the way we design a CPU these days, right? It's kind of like trying to imitate data flow model. So if you write a program that kind of follow the data, data flow model, uh, it allows the compiler to do tricks in a way that it would run faster on hardware. 
actual efficiency, the reason why I say it depends is because the benefit is make compiler more aware of what you're running. And compiler nowadays are actually really smart. It actually does this, right? So uh, you can actually profile, basically write code in the two format, with currying and without currying. And lo and behold, with the modern compiler, it's likely that they will run with the same amount of time because compiler will kind of like automatically do this uh, staging the function for you. Uh, that's it for the recap of what we cover on Tuesday. And today we will move forward with the, uh, the new material. And the first thing I kind of want to mention is there's another good, like, I guess, construct that you can use inside uh, uh, Scala, which is the for all. For all is a recursive data type that have another built-in utility. Uh, if you do x dot for all p, x dot for all p, what is this? This is exactly the same as something like this. You have x, which is a collection, right? x is a collection. p, p is a boolean, I mean, no, no, it's a function that takes in the type and give you true or false. It's a condition check, basically. It check, look at the type and give true or false. And then what for all would do is if, if, Oops, my bad. If X is an empty list, if you are gonna uh, return true. If not, you are going to recursively call for all with the rest of your list and you end with this function, the function that you use here, P, right? To kind of like do this filtering. Basically you kind of like check if it's if everything, right, check for all x, for all x, does p hold? Anyone use for all in Python before? I just want to highlight that these are different. <laughs> uh, this is basically, a, like, this is more like a logic language where you have a collection x and you have condition p. And you want to check if every element in X applies, um, well, basically abide by the condition P. Basically, P has to be true for every single element of X. P has to be true for every single element of X. And here are some of the examples. Uh, consider right the following expression types. Our old friend expression come back to haunt you. So if you haven't finished your in-class exercise, they'll haunt you again over there, but we'll go through them together. So what if we want to map, right? Map the expression uh, that that uh, have the certain uh, to, to a certain function f. Basically we want to map f, apply f to our expression. You want to apply f to expression, right? So here you can do define map. And f return will text in double, return double, because expression eventually you will evaluate to double, right? Uh, this basically would apply the map function on every single element, which kind of like have the same property as the for all, right? You can also use for all to actually set like a for all construct, right? Uh, to, to check if expression are positive. Basically, just, uh, instead of checking for a double and return double, now you text in the double and return true or false, true or false. If it's a positive number, you return true. If not, return false. And you recursively check every single element of your uh, expression, right? So you do for all, if it's constant, just apply the function right away because constant of expression are gonna return uh, uh, double. If not, recursively call this based on uh, the, if it's negation, right? So you want to actually check if the expression of E underscore uh, is constant or not. So you basically recursively call the expression again to get it to constant 
and return the boolean if the expression is positive or negative and so on and so forth. All right. So these are the built-in that you can use, uh, and it's kind of like a, a construct where you can actually apply certain function to all the elements. Right? Apply certain functions to all the elements. There are the fall, there are the map function. Map basically means I apply F to every single thing in my collection. Any questions so far? Because I feel like I echo through them a little bit fast. Otherwise, we will move on to the next topic, which is how can I write the program in a way that function A can communicate something to function B, right? And can someone tell me what would be the most basic form of a way for communication between two functions? Oh, uh, sure, 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 sure. Uh, so the question is, can I explain the for all again? So let me go back to all the way back to here. This for all, like X is a collection. This is a collection. Which means that it's just a bunch of items. It can be a list. It can be a tuple, right? A for all, a for all will apply the function P. We'll apply the function P here. P will take in the elements of the list and it returns true or false. And if everything returned true in the whole collection, you are returning true. Otherwise, if some of the element is false, it returns false. Let me give you an example, which hopefully is more clear. Let's, let's say I have a list that consists of 1, 2, 4, 10, and 20. And P checks if X is even, an even number, right? Over here, and this is X. X dot for all P would basically check if every single element of X is even or not. So in this case, will it return true or false? False, right? Because this is even, the find is even, 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 but this is an odd number, so this is basically false. What if I have a pre prime where it's checked for if x is positive? Then in this case, x dot for all p prime will return what? True. Yep. All right, so I think. Sorry, I just should have used this example way earlier. But this, is this more clear now? Basically, it apply P to everything in X, and if everything return true, return true. If one of anything in here return false, you ended up returning false. With me so far? P is a function, yeah. P is a function, because this is the definition. P is a function that takes in a type and return a boolean. Yeah. So. So that's a for all, and this I think the way to fix this is uh this is more like a map. <laughs> a map is a little bit different in the sense that instead of having a function that return true or false, return true or false, a map would apply f on everything. So let's say I have a list, right? A list again, the same list: one, two, four, ten, and I don't know twenty if I remember correctly. So that's my List x, right? And then p is a function that takes in, let's say, y, and you return y multiplied by 2, right? So x dot map p would basically do this. It would apply the function, which multiply everything by 2 on every element. So what will you get? What will you get if I apply, if I see this, I multiply by two on everything in X. So what will be the resulting list?
Exactly, yeah. So basically, you see, oh, you see 1 multiplied by 2, you see 2 multiplied by 2, you see 4 multiplied by 2, you see 10 multiplied by 2, you see 20 multiplied by 2. So that's your resulting list. All right. Okay, so that's basically how math works. And this is basically applying the for all concept on our expression. We can say, hey, if these expressions are positive or not, right? So one way to check is if, if, if a sum of the Basically, this is not exactly if checking if the expression are positive, but checking if individual constant, if individual constant inside my expression are positive. Something like this. 5 plus 10, these are all positive. Negative 5 plus 10, these are not positive because you have negative 5 right here, right? So this is basically say, hey, let's use the for all concept to check if everything is a positive number. All right, so now let's move on. So is it more clear now with the map and for all? All right, awesome. So now the next thing that, that we want to be able to do is communicate between the full function. So what is the simplest form of a way for a function to say I'm done. I'm done with the function. What what do you usually what what do you, what usually happen? Let's say I have a function call and I I I finished every single line in the function call. What do you happen? What does the parent function that calls this function know that you're done? Yeah, you return a value. Basically, the last line in Scala is a return value, right? So the parent function will get that value back, right? And that's one form of communication between a function, right? You can actually call another function in the middle of the function call too. This is another form of communication. Say, hey, start running, right? So you can actually communicate a cross function that way. But let's let's do more things. Let's actually see if we can perform more fancy things. So let's say we want to convert a string, right? Uh, this string true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, and that one typo at the end, right? And you want to convert this into a boolean, right? Uh, first of all, what, what can go wrong with that input? Yeah, you have a typo right there. So is that a false or is that, I don't know, so I'm gonna throw an exception, right? <laughs> so that's this one here. And also this one here, the true with lowercase, right? The true with lowercase, is that a true? Or is that somehow the format is wrong, right? Yeah, so we gotta do something with these two. And let's look at the function signature first, right? So you can do convert boolean uh, from a list and you have a string, right? And you return a list of boolean. In this case, it'll be a, a list of true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, right? So our first step over here is to, let's use the map function, right? So you convert boolean into a list, and this is, this is a string, right? So you can have a built-in function called split, Anyone want to guess, take a guess on what does split do? It returns a, a collection actually too. So if, if to be more specific, this gives you a collection. It gives you a collection. In this case, you split everything that are in between this comma. So you're gonna get a collection of true, false, true, false, true, false false, true, false, and they are all string. They are just a bunch of smaller string that consists of true, false, true, false, blah, 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 right? And for each of these string, you map the function to the two boolean. Basically, two boolean will convert true to true, false in terms of string false to a boolean false, right? So it will take care of this, 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 everything here, but what the heck here? Okay. So, so over here, you're going to get a list, 
you are going to get a lift, but what might be the problem? We all identify this thing is the problem because somehow that's not a false, right? So what do we do? What do we do? So let's say we want to convert a string to a list of Boolean, right? And this is a signature, right? Oh, sorry, the same slide. So basically, sorry, this is the same slide, my bad, guys. Uh, the two problems here are the lowercase true and the the uppercase false with the typo, right? With me so far? Sorry, I'm kind of embarrassed by having the same copy of the slide <laughs> uh, back to back. But if you look at that, right? You need to communicate this problem, right? You need to communicate this problem. So, what are the things we learned so far? What are the things we learned so far that can be used to communicate this problem? Because we can't just simply return a list. You can raise the error. Perfect, right? So that's that's one way to to communicate. Another way to communicate is we can use an option, right? So so obviously we can throw exception, but okay, if I know a concept of option, so this is basically error, then you do try catch, right? Which is a totally perfect thing to do. What can you do with an option? How can you tell, hey, something might be going wrong? So instead of a list of Boolean, what do we do? Into the list of instead of list of boolean, what can we do instead of that? Can we do something like a list of option of boolean? Would this work? Would this allow the parent function to kind of catch this as well? Anyway, I'm waiting for the answer. Is it a yes or is it a no? Is this good enough? It's a long awkward pause, but the answer is yeah, right? So if you go back, look at our input, this true and false, right? So, oh yeah, what was the question? Basically to communicate that there are problems, right? You can obviously throw an exception. And that's the one perfect way to do it. The other way is, well, if I don't want to throw exception, I want to return a list. If I still want to return a list, one thing I can do is to use an option, right? So basically, if it's true with no typo, or if it's false with no typo, it's going to be an option of Boolean. It's an option of true, option of false. Basically, it will be some true, some false. But if it's a typo, like F-A-L-S-E is not false. Well, F-A-L-S-E, so that's false. Basically, if I have a typo on the word true or false, what can I return? Instead of sum of true, sum of false, I can return what? What are the other thing option can take? The sum of something, right? The sum of true. And what? None, right? In this case, we return none, right? So this is another way to to actually communicate between the two functions as well. Something goes wrong with this particular input, that might be a typo, do deal with it, right? So over here, as we said, we will actually do uh, try catch, right? Try, try catch, you map, you split first, split the string, then map, convert it to a Boolean, convert that to a list, and you return an option, sum of entry. Otherwise, you return none. If it's illegal argument, you return none, right? So this is basically how you can make sure if something goes wrong with a function call, you can communicate, hey, something goes wrong, right? 
This again to iterate over how powerful exception handling as well as the option types can be. Okay. It actually allows you to catch these potential bugs and don't run into the case where you basically the program get into like unknown territory, right? So anyone, uh, so with me so far, any questions about the 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 way to uh, use both options and exception to raise this potentially uh, problematic things when you have wrong inputs? So these are some of the sorry. <laughs> All right. I feel like I have to sneeze, but it doesn't come out. Sorry. Uh, but these are some of the way to raise an exception and handle that, right? Handle the exception. So now we're gonna move on to the main meat of today's class, which is what we call function closure. Function closure. Remember our friend, this bracket thing? Anyone remember we use this curly bracket a lot in Scala? You use it all the time, actually. What does it do? From, from the current understanding, right? What does this curly bracket do? Anyone want to take a stop? And what does what does it mean? It set boundary and put stuff together. Actually, these are our perfect answer. So it set the boundary of these are the definition that I'm gonna define inside this block encapsulated by this curly bracket. It tell you where does the function start, where does the block end, where does the block start, where does the block end, right? So the concept of function closure is this has to do with what we call a scope, right? This gave you the scope of how far we can see. Anyone here play a first-person shooting game before? Yes, no? Uh, so if you, I, I'm sure we all do play that, uh, these kind of games at some point, right? What does it do when I have a scope on a, on a gun in a game? What does it help? It allow you to zoom in, right? But basically, it allows you to see more things. It allows you to see more things. So a function scope, right? A function scope would kind of like allow you to see the range, see the range of definition, right? And now that functions are being passed around, yay! Uh, you have a lot of function calls. You have a lot of recursions. There will be a lot of repeated names like X and Y and C and X, S and R and K, right? Remember, we all use this variable a lot. How can I tell that L belong to what value? <laughs> so if I, I define X somewhere here and then another X somewhere here, basically the first X and the second X belong to a different scope, right? It belongs to a different scope. And with function passing around, the concept behind function closure is really important because you need to know whenever I say X in Scala, which X is that, right? And I can tell you, this will be on your exam. I'll, I'll test like a bunch of like repeated definition of X, Y, and Z, and you need to tell me what value is this. The answer is, is the answer is, the body of a function is evaluated, right? It's evaluated in the environment where the function is defined, not when it's called. And we'll go into the detail here with an example, but by definition, uh, this is called a lexical scope. So let's, let's get the naming right first. A lexical scope means that when I have a function called, let's say I have a function called f, Right, and it takes in x and y. F a function called f takes in x and y. The body of the function will be evaluated the same way when you define the function f. 
not when you call the function out, and this is called the lexical scope. So here's some example. Consider this function, right? Consider this function. And quick note on line six here, it's called by value, called by value. And on that line, x is, sorry, uh, what is the value of x and what is the value of y? Well, I put it here, I should not have done it. X is 12, Y is 4. So anyone here see that X is 12 and Y is 4? Any questions so far? Any questions so far about Y is X uh, 12 and Y is 4? Yes, no, good. Can I, can I go next? to the next uh, thing. All right, then can someone tell me what's the value of x here? Okay, it's 11. In this full call, in this full call, basically now it, it will go, let me change the ink color so that it's more clear. In this full call, basically it's run this function, right? Full of x plus y. Right? So, what is this y? What is the y here? What is the value of y here when you call it on line 6? What would be the value of y? Uh, if actually, so think about this. What is the input to foo? Why is the input to foo? On line six, what's my input? Yeah. So <laughs> basically, it's 16, right? So over here, y is 16 because this is 12 and this is 4. So x plus y is 16. So this is 16. So t will equal to what? 11 plus 16, right? That's 27. Yeah, so I, as easy as this sounds, it actually can be pretty tricky to get it correctly on the exam, right? So just make sure you, you, you like, sip some coffee, but not too much. If you're high on caffeine, you might make mistakes, but make sure you do this and, and make sure you understand what the lexical scope means, right? Over here. Uh, notice that x here is 11. This is the key about lexical scope, x is 11. And not 12, right? x inside function foo is 11 because it's used, it's, it used the value of x at that time when you define the function foo and not 12. All right, so are we good? Do I need to explain any any questions so far? Like, shall I go through this again? Okay, awesome. Yes, I I totally that's okay. Uh, so I'll go through this again. Oh, over here in line one. Oops. Oh, oh my bad. My bad. My bad. Oh, well, you in line one. So I'm going to do this on the side, right? This is the value of x. This is the value of y. On that line one, what's the value of x? Oh, if you change depth to val, will it change anything? Uh, no, because it actually just called by name versus called by value. Uh, over here, when you do val, basically you call by value. And, and over here, you basically evaluate it and put it into t. Then you just, oh, I'm gonna evaluate foo and put it into t right away. So this is 11, right? So what's y? What's y here in line one? Unknown, right? I don't know it yet. If someone use y at this point, the compiler is supposed to yell at you. I don't know what are you trying to do here, right? With me so far? And I'll, I'll do another uh, uh, thing here, which is internal. 
to who, what is who x and what is who y, right? Who x is this, who y is this. Right. So internally, foo x is what? On line number two. So x is still 11, right? Y is still unknown. Foo x is 11, right? Because it is the same x. Basically, foo x will take the value uh, x that we defined so far. And foo y is unknown here because it's just the input. I'm still waiting for an input, right? This line. What if x is 11, right? Y is still unknown. Who x is 11, the same number. What is the foo y? <clears throat> What's foo y? Y again, at the time you define a function foo, y is the input to the function. So what's the input to the function when you do def c equal foo 14? Yes, that's 14. Yep. Right, with me so far, so basically this gives you 25. Right, with me so far. Okay, so uh, the next line, what is x? Now I increment x, right? So x outside of this is 12, y is still unknown. Over here, what is for x? It's 11, yes, because it still take the old value. When you define that function, x will still take the same value. It, it's going to be defined there inside the definition of foo. Foo y, well, we are not using foo right now. So foo y is still not known. We are still waiting to use it, right? Line number five, x is 12, y is 4. Over here is 11, unknown. So everything here is the same except I define y. Over here, x. Is 12, y is 4. What is for x? Eleven, right? And what is for y? What is the value of y here on line six? Sixteen, right? Because it's basically the input here, which is x plus y. You look at x, you look at y, you add them together, you get sixteen. So sixteen goes to here. Yeah. Right, so that's it. Basically, uh, this is how you can work through this. Uh, one easy way to build this table and make sure if things are undefined, put question mark. If things are defined, put in the value, and update it whenever things are uh, get updated. Right. So, any questions? Are you all with me so far? Okay, so let's talk about function closure in the lexical scope, right? So using the last example, using the last example, somehow foo will take the value x in the old environment. Basically, when, when I define foo, x is defined. Right? So fundamentally, if you look at how computer execute, if you assume lexical scope, if you assume lexical scope, the execution will keep this old environment as needed. Will keep this old environment as needed. So a function definition has two parts. It basically has two parts. The code itself, basically the function that you write, right? And the environment where you define the function. What is x over there? Right? What is x over there? It would have to remember that. Right? And this part is what we call function closure. Basically, you are think about this way: you are being teleported back to when you define the function. The environment is like right there, right? Any questions so far? So, if we use lexical scope and you define a function, and you define a function, you're gonna be when you call the function. It will be called based on the old environment where you define that function, right? And the other thing is you cannot really ex you can manipulate this environment basically. It's 
to some degree immutable in a sense, right? Uh, you can't really modify the environment when you define a function. If you want a new environment, define another function. Basically, you can define another function so that it takes in a new environment. Right? Any questions so far? Because I'm going to go a little bit off topic here, right? Because if you think about it this way, if I use lexical scope and have like 100 different function calls, does it mean I have to like use and remember all the environment? Yes or no? Anyone want to take yes? Any, any guess here? Any guess taker here? Is it yes or no? I need to kind of somehow remember all the old environment, right? So with me so far about that. Yeah. So how can I tell that I can forget something now? So my, my question is, if I have function closure and I have lexical, lexical scope, is there a way for, for me to tell, hey, I no longer need to remember full, the function full that I have from the example? I guess, let me go back one step, right? What would be the problem if I have to remember everything and I never have, never, I, I cannot forget it? What will happen to your computer? So let's say you have a computer, right? And you turn it on for 24 hours. Yes, exactly. You're gonna waste a lot of space, right? You're gonna waste a lot of space on your computer's brain, basically on your DRAM to remember everything, right? So imagine this, in, a, in, a, in one second, in one second, right? One instruction takes about one nanosecond. So in one second, you're basically processing hundreds, like hundreds to thousand millions, like billions of instructions basically per second, right? How many function calls are that? It's actually multiple function calls, right? So mean, it means that within like an hour, you can have to process so many function calls. Within a day, you can have to process so many more function calls. So if you cannot forget these things, what is the problem? You're gonna run out of DRAM, you're gonna run out of memory, right? It's the same as if you take a biology class and the professor said, remember everything here. Even after your exam, I'm gonna keep testing it until you graduate from the first day of class, freshman year to your senior year. What's gonna happen to you? Well, um, I mean, you have to remember them, but eventually you have to kind of process how other things you can kind of forget and, and reiterate and build it later if you need it, right? So with the lexical scope, I have to remember things. So the question I have to make and answer is, how can I tell I can forget something? How can I tell I can forget certain things? So what will happen? Let's say you play Dota, Dota 2, right? Yeah, you 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 delete it, essentially. So it's, it's yeah, it's some somewhat set it to none, which is basically means that you free that from your brain, right? You free it from your brain. And one really really nice things about functional programming and this concept of the scope is because the concept of the scope, right? You can look back in time. You can also infer when is this the last time I'll need full. Do I need to remember full if I know that's the last time I'm gonna need full? So my question becomes I have a definition for a function called full. I know this is the last time I'm gonna call function full. After that function call, do I need to remember full? No. Yeah, you can, you can then delete it, right? So this is a concept behind many, many, many modern programming language, actually. 
So if you use certain function calls, if you use certain variables, there's a lot of things going on inside the computer's runtime. Runtime is something you can think of it as like a manager to manage what is running on a computer. As well as the hardware, basically we go and look and free things. Yeah, you don't need to remember this. You don't need to remember if you're done. Free this, free that. You now have more memory, right? So this is why lexical scope is is uh, uh can be another side benefit of it. You can kind of know when to remember things, and you can know when to not remember things. So let's do more examples here, and I'll I'll give you a few minutes to work through this, but. I want you to practice that. What is C? And we'll do this together. So let's let me give you maybe five to ten minutes to work on the problem. In the meantime, I'm gonna go get some water because my throat is really dry. I'll be right back. Is that okay? I'm basically go through this and figuring out what is C. Okay, feel free to type it in on the on the chat. All right. And I'll be right back.
All right. So I got a few answers. That's awesome. So let's go to them, actually. And I believe the answer is correct. So let's go through them. The first line, so we will we'll do this. My bad. We will do the same thing here and put in what is X, what is Y, what is C, and what is T. Right? Over here, the first line X is 1, everything else is unknown. Over here, X is 1. So this X is 1. T is the input. T is basically not the input, my bad. What is T? What is line? X plus one, right? So that X is one, T is two, Y is the input, C is undefined. This line, X is one, Y is your input, And C over here is another input prime, input to the function that you're gonna return. And T is two. Over here, X is four. Y is now undefined. C is undefined. T is undefined. Bar equal make bar two. Well, so what is bar? Bar is now a function text in C and give you what? What does it return? It's going to sort of return C plus. Yeah, C plus four. Right, because now T is two, Y is two, and C is your input. Over here, X is four, Y is one. This is unknown, this is unknown, same thing here. Four, one, C is now three, right? For your input here, for, for the bar here, I guess. Uh, let me erase this a little bit. The C in here is now three. So basically this is three plus four, which makes this seven. Bar three is seven. So the re uh the value of C is now seven. Any questions so far? Do you want me to go through this again? Anyone here want me to go through this example again? Uh, please say something right now or just do a private chat. I don't mind going through this again for sure. Right, long pause. So I assume. Oh yes, okay, awesome. So I'll do this again using a different method. <laughs> so let me use a different method to go through this question. We want to find the value of C right here, right? So it means that you have to find a value of bar three, right? With me so far, basically we want to find what is bar three. So now you can go back and look at the definition of bar, which is defined right here, right? Which is basically make bar two. Oh, oh, so yeah, we will we'll get to that actually. So what is make bar? Actually, let me ask you this question. What is the function signature of make bar? What is the input and what is the output? Exactly. It make bar take obviously take integer. What does it return? It returns this function, right? Return a function. So this is basically the signature, the type, basically the type of make bar. It takes an int, return a function, the text in int, return an int. Right? With me so far. Basically, make bar will give you a function. And yes, the answer is seven, right? Two and two and two plus two plus three. But if you look at the type of make bar, I will give you an, it, it basically, 
is a function that takes in an integer return a function. Oh, yeah. So basically, C is, is seven. You're right. Right. So this make bar two make bar two will give you a function. The function is basically I take in an integer. I'm gonna get an integer, right? And the function that return an integer is basically doing this. This is C as an input return C plus four because at that point T is two. Y here is your input two right here. So that's Y. And two plus two is four. So basically this becomes four plus C, right? So now bar of X is what? So what is bar of something? Let me change the variable name to reduce confusion. What is bar of N? Can someone tell me what is bar of N? It's actually defined in this line right here, that's bar. Right? Exactly. Bar of N is four plus N, right? With me so far? Especially for, for those of you who, who want me to go through this, are you with me? So I want to make sure you, you said yes or no. And it's okay to say no, I, I can go through this again. Never mind. Because I know that my brain plus caffeine is not a good mix <laughs> and teaching. It basically is not like a great mix. Okay, so let me quickly do this, this, this one more time, right? Make bar, oh, my bad. What is make bar two? Make bar two will go back here, right? Are you with me? Basically, are you with me that make bar two would go look at dev make bar and I'll return something? Yes. Hello. Okay. So make bar two would look at this definition and put two in here. With me, right? So this means that T is two. This means that you're gonna put two here because Y is two, right? Because Y is two, this also becomes number two, right? So basically make bar of two will return a function that takes C as an integer and return four plus C. So that's make bar of two. Bar of three means that you're gonna put number three, replace C with number three. So you get seven. So basically that's it. The rest are the trick things that I put in here that doesn't really matter. All right. So this is how you can find what's the value of C. So this is the definition of what we call lexical scope. There's another thing you can do, which is called the dynamic scope. Anyone want to take a guess what does the dynamic scope mean? Lexical scope means that when I call a function, I turn back in time and evaluate a function as if it's that environment. So what would the dynamic scope be? If I call a function, I will evaluate it based on the current environment instead of when it's defined, right? Exactly, when the environment is being called that is being called. So if I update the value x, the x inside the function that I define will get updated, right? And that's the difference. Basically dynamic scope, right? Dynamic scope will keep updating that variable based on a new environment. 
And the thing is, there's quite a lot of body of research, but right now, at the moment, with this current technology, we use lexical scope because it turns out there's a lot more benefit to use lexical scope compared to dynamic scope. All right. So basically, I want to make sure there's a concept of dynamic scope as well. And basically, dynamic scope will keep updating the variable with the new environment, which is actually kind of weird. You, you don't really see that in many programming languages. The reason behind that is because there's a lot more benefit with lexical scope. So most program, at least the program I've seen, you use the lexical scope. All right. So how do we use function closure? What's the benefit, actually? What's the benefit? The benefit here is when, now that we use function as a first class citizen, right? We use a lot of function calls. We use so many function calls. We use recursion. There's no loop, right? In functional programming. So sometimes function can ever evaluate at many, many, many locations, right? A function body, a function body is not evaluated until the function is actually called. But when you call the function, it gets evaluated many times, right? These also, uh, you can have the variable binding, which means that sometimes you bind x to a value, right? Uh, from the example, we have so many versions of x, so many versions of y, right? So when the binding is evaluated, that's when you evaluate the expression. Which basically the key takeaway here, the key takeaway here is with so many definitions of X, Y, C, A, B, G, Zoom, uh, full, uh, all the variable you define so far, it can be confusing what's the value of that variable at that time. This is basically allow you to store the local version of x when you define the function foo for example the x is now stored in that function closure it basically avoid this repeat computation that can happen when you evaluate the function again and again and again and again function closure allow you to say hey that x is four or that y is five right so it makes things easier. It actually can be faster. And here are some more examples, right? I can have a function that call longer than, which take in a list, take in the list. And I want to filter out only a string inside the list that's longer than my input string app, right? So let's say I have a list that say, uh, I don't know, Rashada, uh, coffee, uh, hungry. I don't know why I'm just typing my feeling right now. It's just like, I'm hungry and I need coffee. But let's say S is high, right? Basically my function would compare the length of all the string here and the length of my input string and then Filter. Filter basically means if the evaluation is true, you will keep it. If it's false, you get rid of it. So in this case, you return the same list. If I somehow put in another element, the uh, know A in here, right? Then the filter would just result in Rashada coffee hungry without the string A. Right? So in this case, right, you can use function closure and actually, instead of calling this function many, many, many times, right? Many, many times. The thing is, is this a constant s dot length? Is s dot length constant? Am I gonna change anything with the length of my input string? Hi. Yeah, so s dot length is actually constant, right? So you can evaluate using val, right? 
using DAO, you will then basically put S dub length into our kind of like temporarily variable called threshold length, right? This basically put threshold length to have the value S dot length without you having to evaluate the function S dot length, S dot length, S dot length, S dot length, S dot length all the time. Now it's just one call and you have the value and you can do filter with that, right? S dot length is call, it's call once and with lexical scope, with lexical scope, whatever I do with S, whatever I do with that input is now bound. It's actually now bound to this threshold length and that's it, right? Another example is, let's say I want to do Fibonacci, yay, our old uh, friend Fibonacci. You can define it this way. Any question about the first line? I assume no question about the first line. And my cat are fighting over the cat tree. Okay, sorry. If you hear like ringing bell, they are fighting. Uh, if it's too severe, I might have to stop them. Uh, I can define another function called make people uh, that takes in t, which is basically the number that you want to calculate Fibonacci off. Right, and make people basically just add x to that Fibonacci function. What is the problem here? So if I call make uh, if I say bar equal make fib four of ten, and I so I do bar one because I'm bored. I do bar two bar three bar four right if i call bar one bar two bar three and bar four how many fibonacci function at the end how many fib of 10 that i have to calculate how many times while you're typing let me break up my cat from fighting Uh, four. Every time you call bar, right, you have to do bar of fifth ten. Basically, every time you call bar, you have to do fifth ten, because make people ten define that I'm gonna do people actually of ten, right? So bar one will go. Oh, what's bar one? It's fifth of ten plus one. So I'm gonna call fifth of ten. Finish it plus one. What is bar two? What is bar two? Bar two is, oh, okay, it's fifth of 10 plus two. So I'm gonna do fifth of 10 again plus two. Bar three, I'm gonna do fifth of 10 again plus three. Bar four, fifth of 10 again plus four. So basically this means I have to run fifth of 10 four times, right? With me so far? Because this is basically fifth 10, right, plus one, fifth, 10 plus 2, fifth of 10 plus 3, and this is fifth of 10 plus 4, right? Oh yeah, don't, don't count the recursive call, otherwise there's way too many function calls. Any idea what you can do here? What's the constant here? The con well, x is a variable, fib of 10 is a constant, right? So fib of 10 can be calculated at of time, like who cares, right? So a better function would be I first make the function, put this into a variable, so you have just one variable and return this, right? So you can do this in scalar. You can do this in scalar. And then see 
how long does it take to do F1, then F2, and then F3, and then F4, compared to G1, G2, G3, and G4? Anyone want to take a guess which of these are faster? Is it the F or is it the G? Is F faster or T faster? And yeah, it should be the G. Why is the G faster? Because you compute Fibonacci of 45 only once. So make better Fib4, make better Fib4 when you bind to G. That would take some time. It would take some time to actually run this line. It would take some time to run this line. And then when you do D1, D2, G, D, D4, it will be pretty much instantaneous. It's just one add and you're done. How about this? When I type in these line, line number one on line number two, is one faster or is line number two faster? If I just type it on the keyboard on Scala and hit enter, which one would be faster? So if I have to call G1, G2, G3, G3, that will be faster than calling F1 and F2 and F3. But when I define F, definition of F will be faster than definition of G. And why is that? Anyone want to take a guess why is that the okay? case? So which one of these has to do with Fibonacci of 45 right away? Yeah, we don't calculate Fibonacci 45 yet, right? You wait until F1 is called. Uh, so this is a trade-off. This is a trade-off. So if you know, if you know that you're going to have to call this function many, many times, do it right away at the beginning so that the next time you call it, you don't have to pay the price again. If you're like, this function, I define it. But I might have to use it, but somehow I don't have to do it. Do it the, the first way. So that if you don't have to call that function, don't actually call it, right? Uh, this is a great trade-off to think about when you program, because it actually has to do with how you can make your program a lot more efficient and a lot more, so basically faster, right? So, so these are programming trade-off that, that I really want to kind of get across on top of the theoretical thing that we are learning today, right? Uh, that's it for today's class. One more thing that I kind of want to stress about is now that you learn function closure, anyone want to take a guess what else can we do with this concept? That also doesn't really have a lot to do with the programming part itself, but it's more to do with how are you going to actually run your program? So I'm going to go a little bit sidetracked, but it also takes in the concept of what we learned so far, right? So let me tell you a story uh, of how you, I guess, where, uh, basically, if you have a program, anyone ever wonder how does a program get run? Like how do computer actually execute these programs? And it's it just a yes or no answer. So, so feel free to say, hey, I, I never wonder about it. I just want to keep it a black box and I'll just deal with programming part and algorithm. Or some of you might want to learn how to actually, how does the program get compiled? How does the OS manage to deal with all this variable, right? How does the system manage to free up the memory, right? And the concept behind the function closure concept behind the scope, concept behind whether my variable definition like x and y and z are going to be alive by a certain point of time. These actually go into how to make your computer as efficient as possible so that you can have as many Chrome tabs as you can have right now on your browser without your computer crashing yet. Right? 
So these things actually have a lot of depth into the system side, the compiler side of things. Uh, and it's actually factor into how to make sure your computer would run normally and how the system would still not crash in. How can you make a system that's fast? Why the certain version of Windows are better than the other? For example, Windows 7, Windows 10 is slightly faster than... Anyone here heard of a Windows Vista? <laughs> Remember back in the day? Yeah, so, so these are these are certain elements of the system design, the compiler design, basically how to actually make your program run, right? So there's a lot more into computer science and computer engineering than say algorithm, which is really important, right? The algorithm side, the structure side, the front end side, the application development side. Okay, so that's basically it, right? Uh, before we leave today, one lead herring I kind of want to bring up we have exam coming up uh, soon-ish, but this is what I'm going to propose. Uh, first of all, the exam will cover the functional programming parts, right? So we will do a review session for sure before the exam. And these are the remaining topics, the type system and the other concept called future and promises. And I believe we can finish both of them by next week. Basically, well, no, I forgot. Uh, yeah, next week is fine because we have a makeup class. So we have two classes next week and we can finish these remaining topics, but, but I think you will benefit from having assignment two out a little bit longer. So here's my proposal. After we are done with the remaining topic, after we are done with the remaining topic, I will keep going into parallel programming. So that I, uh, this would hopefully allow you to absorb what we learned so far and do the review. So next week is the last week for the topic cover for the exam. The week after is a normal class plus a review session. Then the week after is the exam. Is that okay? Basically, we, you make sure you have at least a week to review whatever you want to review for the quiz. Is that good? Or do you want to do it right away? Okay, so I see some thumbs up. Uh, if there's no, if there's no argument for having the exam earlier, we'll do that. Basically, there'll be one more lecture on the, the topic after the quiz. And, and, then basically we'll do a review session and then the quiz will be the tuesday after that all right okay and that's it for today's lecture part actually uh before we go into the type system which is a huge topic i can't continue on otherwise we'll go over time for sure right so let me stop the recording here and we